The 9-8 time signature is one of the least commonly used but most often confused time signatures in all of music. In this video, what I'd like to do is really clearly describe what 9-8 can be. And by the end of this video, you should have a good understanding of why people fight and argue about this time signature, but more importantly, how to write with it and when to write with it. It's really important to remember that there are two perspectives on this time signature. There's the perspective that's traditionally taught in schools and music classes, which I find to be very confusing and not too practical. There's another perspective that isn't so traditionally taught, which I find to be very freeing and easy easy to understand. So I'd like to start off by teaching the less traditional method and then in the second half of the video we'll approach the formal perspective. So let's get started. To recap, 9-8 means we're just going to have a measure with nine eighth notes in it. So to figure out what that really means, let's start with something a little simpler. I'll begin by just looping four steady quarter notes, four even beats. Now eighth notes are played at a speed of two per beat. So if I try to fill this measure up with eighth notes, I obviously end up with eight eighth notes. But if I extend our loop by a single extra eighth note, we'll have a measure of nine eight. And as you can hear, this feels like four four, but the fourth beat feels really long compared to the other three. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. I could add in another kick drum hit on this extra eighth note, but the next kick drum will come rushing in so fast that it'll feel like this extra beat gets cut off early. To count this rhythm and keep track of it, you could just count to nine really fast at the pace of eighth notes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one. Or you could try to count eighth notes formally, but it'll feel just a little funny. One and two and three and four and five, one and two and three and four and five, one. You could also subdivide the number nine into smaller groupings like four plus five and count those instead if it's a little easier. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, one. So this is the 9-8 structure. It's 9 eighth notes. It's four and a half quarter notes. And pretty much anything you can cram into that space is valid and legal for 9-8. Let's try to work with this a little bit. We'll keep that kick drum pattern the exact same, but we'll come up with a rhythm that's more interesting than just straight eighth notes. For example, I could take a dotted quarter note, and then a regular quarter note, and then a half note. That all adds up to 9 eighth notes. And that rhythm is far more interesting, in my opinion, than just straight eighth notes. Now let's say I wanted to add some steady eighth notes on top of this groove. Obviously, I'll be able to fit in nine eighth notes in each measure, but look at how I beam my eighth notes. The way I beam my eighth notes actually represents the underlying groupings of my riff. Now this isn't necessary, but it's highly advised that if you're writing in these odd times that you beam your eighth notes and sixteenth notes together in a way that does reflect the underlying pulses. In 4-4, four, four, we traditionally beam our eighth notes into groupings of four or two to help us show where the divisions of the beat are. But in these odd meters, a lot of times we're not grouped in all fours, so it's very helpful to beam your notes in structures that represent the underlying pulses. Now let's add some notes to that exact same rhythm. I was thinking something kind of jazzy, kind of uh, funky, so I picked the key of A minor or A Dorian, anything with an A minor tonic, and I picked the note A for my root, the flat seven is G, and the minor third is C. So just adding those notes to this rhythm gives me this little groove. I'm going to think of that pattern as 3 plus 2 plus 4, and that's how I'm going to count it. Now, let's just rearrange things a little bit. Instead of 3 plus 2 plus 4, let's try 4 plus 3 plus 2, and that still adds up to 9. And we'll change the notes a little bit to outline the A minor triad, A, E, and C. Alternating between these two ideas gives me this riff.
So now I've got this riff that goes 3 plus 2 plus 4, and then 4 plus 3 plus 2. If I want to really add a drum groove to this, I have a billion possibilities. We could have the drums just accent these rhythmic groupings only using the kick drum and the snare. Then I could add in steady eighth notes on a hi-hat or a ride cymbal. Or instead of steady eighth notes, I could obviously put in 4.5 quarter notes to fill up this measure. And a fun alternative here is to play steady quarter notes. This would overlap my measures, creating accents on the downbeat for the first measures and accents on the upbeat for the second measures. So it would take nine full quarter notes for this pattern to repeat again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine. Now I don't have to build my drum groove off of the rhythm that we already have. We could come up with a brand new 9 8 rhythm pattern for our drum groove and then listen to how it cross plays with the underlying rhythm of the riff. For example, I could reverse each grouping to create this pattern of 4 plus 2 plus 3 and then 2 plus 3 plus 4. and then continue to keep the hi-hats the same. Or we could ignore the underlying riff and go back to that 4.5 quarter note feel with the extra eighth note at the end. These are all legitimate options and they all classify as 9-8. It's very important to remember that this is an extremely freeing time signature. There's a lot of groupings you can do and there's a lot of fun little subdivisions you can make. If you'd like to hear a good example of this time signature being used right at the beginning of a song, you could take a listen to Dream Theater's Voices, which starts off with quite a few measures of nothing but just straight 9-8. It's very easy to feel it as 4.5 quarter notes. So that all makes perfect sense to me, and for most people they can understand that concept very well. But that's not the way 9-8 is traditionally taught. Now to understand this formal perspective, we need to understand formal meter. Double meter refers to any measure that has two even beats in it. Triple meter refers to any measure that has three even beats in it. And quadruple meter refers to a measure with four even beats in it. Now by default, these meters are simple meters, which means they get each beat gets divided by two. So in our double meter, we can divide each pulse into two. In triple meter, we can divide each pulse into two and so on and so on. Compound meter refers to the fact that we are dividing each beat into three. So compound double meter means we have two even pulses, but each pulse is subdivided into three even pulses. So we have two even beats like this, one, two, one, two. Two, but each pulse is divided by three. One, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three. And you might know this as the six, eight time signature. Six, eight is defined as compound double meter. It has two even beats, but each beat is divided into threes. So three per pulse is very important when we're, when we're talking about compound meters. Applying this concept to triple meter, well, we have three even beats, and each one of those beats is gonna get subdivided into three pulses. So we'll have one, two, three, 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 and so on and so on and so on to make a measure of nine, eight. Now this is the formal perspective on nine, eight. This is the way it's normally taught that nine, eight is compound triple meter and it's felt as three per pulse. But hopefully the last section showed you that's not the only option available. But let's take a look at this perspective in action. One of the earliest pieces I learned that was in the traditional 9-8 was a Matteo Carcassi study in E minor. As you can see in here, it's all divided into three groupings of three. One, two, three, 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 one, two, bass note changes every nine notes. So it makes sense to call this a measure of nine eight. And here's how we're supposed to count this. One and a two and a three and a one and a two and a three and a one and a two and a three and a one and a two and a three and a Now this is the way we're supposed to count in nine eight, but I don't like this because to me the phrase anda 
is supposed to be reserved for 16th notes. When I think of and, I think of one and a two and a three and a four and a. And now we're being told to count one and a two and a three and a. So I don't like, you know, mixing up both of those feels by using the same verbiage. So me personally, I'm just going to count these as triplets instead. One triplet, two triplet. And hopefully you realize that 9-8 and 3-4 with triplets are indistinguishable to the ear. Playing three notes per beat in 3-4, and we call that triplets, or playing three notes per pulse in 9-8, we call that 9-8, it's the exact same effect to the ear. We have three even beats, each is being divided by three. So 3-4 three, with triplets and traditional 9-8, there is no difference in those two meters. The only difference is the way that they are written and the way they are read. Sometimes one of these time signatures might be more appropriate to write with as opposed to the other. For example, take a listen to this little motif from Flight of the Valkyries. It's very easy to read when we write it in 9-8. But if I tried to take this measure and convert it into 3-4 with triplets, it becomes pretty confusing to parse. So if the question is, when are you supposed to write 9-8 versus 3-4 with triplets, I really think it just depends on what is easier to read and what is going to get the point across the easiest. But it's so important to realize that these time signatures are not restricted to one or the other. I think it's a, a, a red herring, I think it's a terrible approach to take to say that 6-8 can only be played as compound double meter. You know, there are some measures that border the line, they walk the line between both of them, they'll play with hemiola. Same thing with 12-8, 12-8 is this same concept I mean if you understand what we talked about here today you can apply it to 12 8 you can apply it to 6 8 but it's not a rigid structure there's sometimes you know gray area in between and it seems like a lot of people that like to discuss music theory but don't do a lot of writing on their own they seem to want to say that no 12 8 can only be played as compound quadruple meter and you know 9 8 can only be played as three per pulse uh, of groupings of three I don't like that perspective at all, and I think it's really confusing. I think of just looking at a group of nine eighth notes and thinking of all the different ways that we can organize it, well, one of those ways is three plus three plus three. And to say that that is the only way to interpret nine eight, I think is just uh, not very helpful. Even the nomenclature and verbiage, I feel like it just needs to be thrown away. I don't find that phrases like quadruple compound time, I don't think that's helping anybody understand or write or compose music any bit better. I think just understanding the space of a measure and the way it can be divided is far more helpful to the modern composer than memorizing all of these formal phrases. What's really important to remember though is accenting twos versus accenting threes in an odd meter like nine is going to give you completely different feels. If you're in nine and you're accenting every two notes, you're going to get a really herky-jerky, progressive rock, polymetric feel. And if you're accenting every three in a nine-eight measure, it's going to feel much smoother and much more, you know, with the time. The first time I personally realized this magic transformative property of nine-eight was through a twist a song called Get Me. Somebody left the Kamikaze album in my car in high school and it was the opening of the doors for me for hip-hop and rap. Twista's rhythms blew my mind. I couldn't understand what he was doing. And I thought as a progressive rock musician, you know, if I can't understand these rap vocals, there's clearly something I need to learn here. So the song Get Me is just in 6-8. Very easy to count as a simple pattern of six. One, two, three, four, five, Now, I could take each one of these counts and subdivide it into three by counting triplets. But if I accent every second note of my triplet, listen to how disjointed this rhythm gets. And this is the exact rhythm that Twista starts rapping in the song, except he starts it on the two beat and it ends up landing right on the one beat. So when I first heard this in high school as like a prog rock kid, I was sitting there counting as fast as I can and thinking, oh my God, Twist is writing in 9-8. This is progressive rap. And it took me a long time to realize, no, this is just... This is just triplets. This is what happens when you start playing with subdivisions of threes and accenting them in twos. The song is just in 6-8. And if you want to think of it as 3-4, you could. But I think of it as just as a 6-8. And it's funny that just through the uh, accent and the performance on top, I was confused into thinking of it as 9-8 and counting it as 9-8 just because of the rhythmic complexity of those rap vocals. So I sincerely hope that by the end of this video, you are less confused and not more confused about odd times and compound meters. If you did learn something from this video and enjoyed 
enjoyed it and appreciate it, please thank my Patreon supporters for making it possible. They do sponsor these videos, and they're the only reason these videos continue to exist. If you'd like to support this channel, you can join them. There's links below in the description. You can also consider supporting this channel by checking out my songwriting and music theory course, which is available on my website. So thanks for watching. I will see you next time. Thank you.